Psalm 52 is a, is a psalm about troublemakers, about dealing with uh, problematic people. Uh, I called them dragons, and we met last week uh, Doeg the dragon, who was uh, David's nemesis, his problem. Um, and if you haven't had a dragon in your life yet, um, just wait around. Uh, this is uh, not to discourage you, but if you are living for God, people will come against you uh, who want to uh, silence you uh, in your faith. Uh, several years ago, uh, I, last week I introduced you to the man who told me when I was a new pastor. Uh, remember what he told me? What he tell me? <laughs> You're not going to make it. I would love to call him today. I don't know where he is. I don't even know if he's still alive and say, you know, God had other plans for my life. When you tried to discourage me, derail me, uh, I'm glad I listened to my calling because uh, God is great. Um, but I want to introduce you to a, a lady today. Uh, so we could look at, uh, we could call him like Dave the Dragon last week. Uh, today we're going to look at Donna the Dragon. Uh, and don't look at her name. Don't start Googling her name or anything. It's a fictitious name, okay? Like I'm totally going for the information. It's not there. It's a fictitious name. Donna the Dragon. Uh, uh, San Diego is where she was from. Uh, and she planted herself in a vibrant growing church in North County, San Diego, where, where I am from. Uh, and years ago, uh, she let everybody know on her presence there that she as an older lady really knew the word of God. Uh, and it became apparent that she knew chapter verse of most things they talked about. So the women's ministry director decided that the most uh, logical thing to do was to take this biblically educated woman and, and put her in charge of a Sunday school class for ladies on Sunday mornings. That was their first mistake because they didn't really vet her. Uh, from the beginning of her class, she began to drop in little uh, statements here and there that attacked the pastor. Then she attacked the elder board. Uh, and then when nobody would respond to her, what do most dragons do? Quit? No. She attacked even more. Next Sunday, she'd throw in a little bit more, and the next Sunday, a little bit more. And so when everybody just sat there and nobody ever said anything, uh, she just became more bold and brazen. Uh, the zenith of her power grab, and that's what she was about as a power grab. And by the way, the pastor was an excellent pastor. When I was a young pastor uh, in my early 30s, I used to look to that man to say, wow, that guy is a great shepherd. Uh, he loved his sheep. He loved his church. He loved the gospel. He, he had a huge impact in, in North County, San Diego, a great expositor of the word of God. His church was thriving. They couldn't even, they, where are they going to put everybody? And then along came this lady and made his, his life and the life of that church extremely miserable. During an annual business meeting, uh, she showed up, and she waited for her opportunity to speak, uh, of which she uh, grabbed a microphone. And at that day and time, uh, all the elders sat on the stage, and, and the pastoral staff sat on the stage, uh, and gave their reports to the church. Uh, when she got the opportunity, she stood up and began to publicly berate the pastor, attacked his character. Uh, when no one stood up to oppose her, she attacked his wife who was in the audience, when no one stood up to oppose her, she attacked his children, his high schoolers. No one on stage said a thing. Uh, what do you think eventually happened to that growing, going church? It died. It died. It's the saddest thing. It died quickly. And it all started with a lady who was a dragon, who wanted power and, and didn't like the the fact that the pastor taught the word of God, that bothered her. And she, she really wanted the power that he had. And she did everything within her power to subvert that church. That pastor uh, eventually uh, was so discouraged that he left ministry uh, altogether, never to return to it. And when I heard that uh, through my San Diego grapevine, and there does, one does exist in the state of California, when I heard, uh, you know, through the grapevine that he had, he left the pastoring altogether because of what she had done to him, I, I was, I don't even, I was just sad that the devil had got one, uh, a great man of God. Uh, this topic that David talks about here is a real thing because maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not a pastor and that, that kind of stuff doesn't happen to me, but it can happen with a mother-in-law. No one's going to say. Maybe she's with you for Christmas. A father-in-law could happen with a boss. Uh, it, uh, a commanding officer, somebody who sits on your review board. I mean, I don't, it can happen in a variety of ways. Uh, and perhaps you have met them. What do you do with them? Uh, how should you deal with them? That is the big question when you deal with a, a person that's a troublemaker and a dragon. And bear in mind, uh, as I told you last week, and I'll repeat myself again, um, the old uh, belly gunner uh, in a B-17 that taught me how to be a pastor, Dr. Bill Yeager, uh, took a church from 169 sick people and built it in over 30 years to a church of 5,000 in Modesto, a great pastor. Uh, but he told me as an old belly gunner in World War II, he goes, Marty, you must understand as a young pastor the, the difference between a sheep, 
uh, and a goat that doesn't know God and a wolf that looks like a sheep. And boy, was the old uh, Pilate. I mean, was, was he not true? How do you deal with a dragon? So this is what David says. So we're just going to do a little bit of review. There's only two points in this sermon. Uh, how could a two-part sermon last for two Sundays? Easy, easy. Because David spends a lot of time describing the dragon's activity. Because why, why? And he's really repetitious. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff in here that the Reader's Digest version would probably excise because it's too redundant. But if God's redundant, it's for a good reason. Because if you have children, you, you're going to say something like this. How many times have your mother and I told you? Have you done this? Or maybe you got totally godly children. Just one time does the trick. See, this is God saying, how many times have I told you about dragons? You need to wise up. So what does David have to say? He says, uh, well, I wrote this to the chief musician. It's a song that they actually sang in worship. Uh, it's a contemplation of David. Uh, when did it occur? Well, it happened when Doeg the Edomite went and uh, gave some uh, intel to Saul, king, and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Uh, and David then turns to Doeg, his, his, his enemy, the troublemaker, and says to this man, who we know from last week, uh, once uh, King Saul found out Ahimelech the priest, uh, had, an 85 priest had sided with David, well, then he did what troublemakers do. They tried to silence the moral voice, the spiritual voice. So he, Doeg stepped forward and said, I'll take out all those priests. He killed 85 priests. And then that wasn't enough for him. He, he went and took out their, their town, men, women, and children. So David mocks him here. Uh, I think it's called sarcasmos as a figure of speech. He says, why do you boast in evil, you mighty man? This is not a positive statement. This is David saying, I am a warrior. You're not a warrior. You're a man who murders people. Uh, what should have happened, he says here, you, you have forgotten the goodness of God endures continually. We're reviewing in case you're new this Sunday. He says, um, the goodness of God endures continually. That's what Doeg forgot in his attack on King David. The lady in question, remember uh, Donna the dragon? Remember her? Um, what should have happened in a Sunday school class when somebody started, when, uh, when she started uh, subverting church leadership and subverting the pastor, attacking his personality, attacking his character? What should have happened in the class of, of ladies? What should have happened? Pretty simple. Someone should have done what? Spoken up. Somebody should have said, uh, is that true? Do you have factual information from that? Why are you bringing that up in public? Uh, and shouldn't, if, you're, if you have to confront over something, shouldn't you do that in private? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that every Sunday in your Sunday school class? Etc. No one said anything. What that lady forgot, Donna, uh, and what Doeg forgot is God continually is loyal to his people. So at the end of the day, he's always going to come and defend you. Now, we're the McDonald's kind of people. You drive down here to get lunch. You pull in. You give your order, trying to figure out which window do you stop at. That's me. First one, second one. You sit there at the box. No one's there. You pull around to the second one. There's actually someone there speaking to you. You order your food. And when you go around the corner, what do you want in about two minutes? I want my food. See, we kind of see spirituality like that. But when you, when you want to walk with God and, and you're facing a troublemaker, uh, God's telling you, I'm with you while you're in line. But I also have a waiting room. Have you been in that waiting room? Sometimes you're in that waiting room for a long time. But God's telling you, whether I act quickly, sometimes he does with the troublemaker, sometimes he makes you wait a few years where he shapes and hones you, uh, whittles you down, humbles you. Uh, but God always comes through to bring definitive action, as we're going to see. He's always there with his people, no matter what. Uh, Paul the Apostle uh, planted many churches in his day and time. The church that gave him the most trouble as a shepherd was the church he planted in Corinth, the Corinthian church. That was his church plant. Uh, they attacked him all of the time, uh, these highly educated uh, Grecian uh, believers in that particular city. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read of some of the things that they said against him. Notice what they say against Paul, their pastor who founded their church. For his letters, they say, it's plural because he had more than one dragon in that church. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Oh, what are they saying about Paul? Well, they're not attacking his theology or his understanding of the Torah. No, they're saying, uh, you know, when he writes a letter, it's powerful, it's bold, it's courageous, it's in your face, it's boom. But have you ever seen him in person? He's kind of overweight. He needs to shave, his hair's all messed up. Doesn't, I mean, what's up with the guy? And his speech is kind of contemptible. I mean, he doesn't have the erudition that our great teachers in Greece have. His vocabulary is not all that fantastic. I mean, when you see him in person, it's kind of like, that's him. So that's what they're saying. 
See, when they can't handle your theology and your moral walk and, and your belief system based on the word of God, they then attack your person. That's what they did to Paul. Back to the, I'm, still, I didn't add, I'm adding to the scripture in case you're wondering. Verse 11 says, let such a person consider this, that what we are uh, in word by letters, we are, in, we are when we're absent. Such we will also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but by measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, they're not wise. What does a dragon do? They measure themselves by themselves. I am awesome. I'm destroying people all around me, but it is my spiritual gift. And I just move from church to church, spreading the love of destruction. They measure themselves by themselves. But Paul says, if you measured yourselves by God, you would find out you don't measure up. So what Paul says, I, when I write you a letter, I am powerful in the letter, and I have the guts and the courage when I show up to be bold and courageous and say what needs to be said, call a spade a spade, whatever you want to call it, when I'm with you face to face. In our vernacular, basically, they were, they were saying Paul was chicken. Oh, he can write a tough letter, but yeah, he folds like a lawn chair when he's in, in your presence. It's a southern, it's not in the Bible, don't look it up, okay? I learned that one from Darren years ago. Uh, so unlike the leaders in San Diego, uh, Paul did not put his head in the sand, but he exposes uh, the evil from the dragons that he had to deal with. And these are the people that many he had led to Christ who turned against him. Imagine the sadness there. See, David was in uh, all about warning the dragon of the error of their ways. Now, this is interesting. I mean, you, when you deal with a person like this, you just want God to shut them down, deal with them. And David's like, you need to warn them. Why? Christ died for them too. I mean, what better thing for the dragon uh, to become a sheep? So you need, to, you need to warn him. That's what he does. And so he breaks it down in clear terms. That's all introduction. We're now into my sermon. Are you with me? I have five people. Excellent. Praise God. <laughs> Verse 2. He says, uh, speaking to the dragon, uh, let me describe you. He says, your, your tongue devises destruction, and then he uses simile. Uh, it's, it's like a sharp razor. It, you're working deceitfully, like all the time. Uh, you love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. Selah is just the way to end a clause in the Hebrew text. He says, you love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God will, shall likewise destroy you forever. He will take you away and pluck out your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Wow, talk about forceful. Uh, two things he's gonna show us here. Number one, that when you deal with the troublemaker, the dragon, wherever that is in your life, first of all, you must expose their activity with specificity. You must be very specific that this is exactly what they're doing because they don't want anybody to know what they're doing, but you specifically address privately and if you have to publicly, exactly what they're doing. Uh, he says in verse two, your tongue devises destruction. Uh, the Hebrew word here is hava, and hava means to dig a, a pit that someone would fall into and they can't get out of it. If you go with us to Israel, uh, whenever they open the country back up and we go, we're planning a trip in 2022, uh, I think in March, uh, and we have 120 people signed up for 55 slots, so it's gonna be busy. Uh, but if you go to the Dead Sea, around the perimeter of the Dead Sea are uh, tar pits. And there are signs posted, do not go out here. Uh, because if you go out there and walk across the sand and all of a sudden the, the ground breaks away and you fall into a tar pit, I'm doing the funeral. I mean, we're not getting you out of there. And this is what people are, are like when they're destructive. They're like digging pits all around you, waiting for you to fall into it. They're setting you up. They're setting you up. We'll see they did this to Jesus in his day and time to, to shut him up. They dug pits all around him. And he says, when people fall into your pits and, and, and it destroys them that you set up, it's like getting cut with a sharp razor. Have you ever been cut with something really sharp and you didn't know it? And that happened to me the other day. And I was working on something in the garage and I noticed blood and I'm thinking, wow, man, who's bleeding? You know, and I'm the only person out there. Uh, and I'm like, uh, cause I didn't feel it at all. It was so sharp when I got cut. Uh, and then I realized, oh, that, that's me, I, I'm cut. That, that's the way it is when you're dealing with uh, like Donna the dragon. She cuts you either to your face or behind your face, uh, usually behind your back. And then when you find out about it, you didn't even know you were bleeding. He says, uh, if you're deceptive, uh, that's what it's like. It's, uh, you got hit by a train and you didn't even know it. You didn't even know it. Your words are they're deceptive. Uh, when I was uh, planting a church and we you know, had you know, just a handful of members, I mean like 19, uh, and had like 45 people, 40, 45 people in church and we were growing, uh, we needed to start some kind of kids club, but we didn't have a building because we were meeting in a high school. 
Uh, and, and so we decided, Liz and I decided, we had a big backyard and I would let people walk on my turf, which is a big thing for me. Oh, I'll do it. Uh, and so we decided to have a kids club in our backyard. So prior to doing the kids club, there was Donna the dragon at my church. And she was passing around to all the people uh, this particular lie. The pastor, he doesn't love children. And people are like, huh? I mean, he's got two children and one special needs child. I mean, he cares for them and seems like he loves them. Oh, no, no, trust me on this. He doesn't. He doesn't love them. So then, so I plant, I heard this. So I planned a backyard Bible club. And uh, so, you know, and that shows that I love children, correct? Thanks. <laughs> and so then she, she came with her child uh, to the backyard Bible club. And I had asked a whole bunch of people, would, you, would somebody step up, one of the guys, step up and do games? Nothing, crickets. No guy would do games. So what do you have to do when you got minimal people to volunteer? You volunteer yourself. So I realized I gotta be the game guy. So I, stepped, I got all the games together, ran the games in my backyard, and I kid you not, Donna the Dragon sat on my patio, leaned over to another lady who told me what she said um, as I was running the games. Look at him. He's a control freak. Huh? And when I heard this, like, are you kidding me? I can't win with this lady. I don't love children. Okay, I'll open my whole, uh, to the whole neighborhood. I'll have kids everywhere. Walking on my precious turf, I don't care. I'm a turf guy, in case you don't know, I'm a former landscaper. Um, and then when I do that, then she flips it around to me. Why? Because her words are like a razor, aren't they? You get cut by that, and it's like, wow, how do you defend yourself? I used to go around as a young pastor and try to defend myself from all of the, the personal attacks and names they would call me. Guess what? It's a part-time job. You cannot do it. I was so tired of trying to put out the fires. Well, that's not me, and that's not me, and that's not me. My best friend, Rick Seeley, who was head of homicide, he came to me one day. He was on our elder board. He came to me, uh, came by in his undercover car one day and came in to talk to me and sat down. He's a big old power lifter, like, you know, 20-inch neck, big dude. He sits down, he goes, we need to talk. I'm like, what? He goes, Marty, Marty, all these things that people say about you that attack you, he goes, are, are any of these things you? No. He said, he goes, let's list them. So he starts listing them. Is that you? No. Is that you? Mm -mm. About that? Uh -uh. No. No. He said, those are all lies. He goes, you, you don't have to embrace those. You're free, brother. It was, it was a turning point in my life. I was like, absolutely, that's not me. And, and so I walked away because all they try to do is use deceptive words to destroy you like that lady in my backyard. Their tongue devises destruction. Now, he says here that they, their words are like a sharp razor, and you can't see it in the English text, but you can in the Hebrew text. And not that this will mean anything to you, the first part of this, but the second part will. This is called a pu'al participle. So, so you're already laughing because it's like, I don't really care about that. I, I know you don't, but, so you don't care about the pu'al participle, but you should care about the participle. Why? Grammar matters. Because what it's telling you is this person sharpens their razor constantly. Remember back when you used to get haircuts, guys? and you would go into the barber shop and the barber had a straight razor and a long strap. Remember this? Do you remember this? My dad was a federal agent in charge of the border station. First time I got a haircut was in Mexicali, Mexico. I went over with my dad with his uniform, walked in, they set me down in a big chair. There was windows all across from me. Uh, the Mexican man sat down, my dad spoke Spanish. I did not, I was like five. He set me in one of those booster seats and the guy pulled out a blade that looked like 30 feet long. And he sits next to me, pulls the strap out, and he begins to do this slowly. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm looking at my dad. Hello, uh, papa, you know, uh, problema. <laughs> you know, he puts a lather on my neck, goes, what's happening to me? You know, this is, like a, this is like a dragon. They're just constantly sharpening the blade and smiling at you like you're going down. So do you be afraid of them? No, because who's with you? God, God. It says uh, a worthless person in Proverbs 6, a worthless person, that's a dragon, is a wicked man. They walk in, in, with a perverse mouth. Uh, he winks with his eyes, shuffles with his feet, points with his fingers. Like, eh, you, you need to watch him. He's a control freak. I was a pastor of a small church plant waiting to delegate things to other people. Uh, uh, no. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. That's what he does. Do you remember the OJs? It's not a bird. It was a group. They had an awesome song back in the 60s called Backstabbers. How many remember this hit? Uh-huh. Didn't you ever read that and think, yeah, I totally know that person. 
Yeah, backstabbers. See, that's the way these people are. That, that would probably be Donna the Dragon's like theme song. She's a backstabber. So if you are a backstabber, I've been praying for you uh, because uh, God wants to convert you. He wants you to repent and find peace because I know from dealing with them, uh, you're not happy. You have no peace. And I pray that God moves in your life in a profound way. But in the meantime, we're gonna pull the curtain back on what you do because that's what David did. Look at verse three. He says, you love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. So they push evil, but they don't preserve the good. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like our culture. They, they push evil and they don't want to preserve good. I mean, sometimes I look at a given week and think, what other evil thing can people think to do? Guess what? They never let me down. There's always something else. And I think like, when, when will righteous people stand up for things that are holy and moral and say, enough of that? Well, uh, the way is wide to destruction. The path is narrow to life eternal. And so we have lots of opposition with dragon types. Um, Isaiah warns us in the fifth chapter of his book, a nation is well nigh unto the judgment of God. Read the whole fifth chapter. It's the woe chapter of the book of Isaiah. He, he says, woe to the nation who substitutes light and darkness and switches them and calls darkness light. And he goes all the way down the list. And you can read that list and there's much about our nation. That's that list. Because troublemakers like in Isaiah overthrew the country. Uh, Isaiah tells us many years later, uh, be brave like I was and speak to your nation, to those about you. Because uh, they will devour a family, your job, uh, even a country. He says uh, in verse four, you love all devouring words. You, you have a deceitful tongue. Have you got the picture yet that they are deceitful in how they speak? They lie. They lie. They don't tell the truth. They lie all of the time. Uh, he says, you love all devouring words. Uh, if you go to a steakhouse, like Ruth Chris Steakhouse, and you, I, like I did the other night uh, to celebrate uh, with my family, a, a thing in our family, um, and I'd never been there before. I heard it was great. Have you ever been there? You know, and they, and they bring the steak out, and it's like a gazillion dollars, and you're like, huh? I think we had, we had a gift card or something for the place, and it's not where I normally go, but they bring the steak out, and you find out that's, you just ordered just that, and then you got to order the other stuff. Are you kidding me? I'm never coming back here. But... <laughs> I'm too cheap, but it's like they bring the steak out and it's like, that is the most amazing piece of meat I've ever seen. And you, you just cut into it and it just kind of melts on your plate, melts in your mouth. You want to eat that whole thing, do you not? See, that's what this word means. You love all devouring words. It's kind of an eating term. You, they love words that will completely swallow a person. So if Twitter works as for a beat down on a godly person, they'll use Twitter. Uh, if Facebook uh, it, it can it work effectively, they're going to use Facebook. Uh, if they can spread around all kinds of information about you to friends and family that will destroy you, they'll do it. Sometimes they'll use a profanity, won't they? They'll use a lot of profanity. In fact, you see a lot, a lot of that today. Uh, when reason has left the stage and it's been re replaced by, well, venomous language. And so they use all kinds of venomous language, a lot of filthy words, like a B-52 strike. You never saw the planes coming and then everything just blew up just all over you. I've had it happen to me. It's like not much content, but a whole lot of bad words. You, you know what I'm saying? No logic, no reasoning, just vile. Remember your Lord Jesus, what he faced in his day and time. Uh, parable of the vineyard owner in Luke chapter 20, verses 1 to, 8, 1 to 18 is most instructive. The parable of the vineyard owner is Jesus uh, like David, pulling the curtain back on the religious authorities of his day uh, who were uh, destroying the nation. And so he tells this parable about a, a wealthy vineyard owner uh, that lets his uh, hired hands take care of the vineyard while he's, he's gone, and he sends servants back to check on his, 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 his property every once in a while. But they get rid of all the servants, so he finally says, well, I'll send them my son to check on my property, and surely they'll respect my son. And in the parable, all the people running the place say he's sending his son. If we take him out, we own the whole thing. So they kill the son. When you get to verse 19 of the parable, the after effect, here's what we read. And the chief priest and the scribes uh, that very hour sought to lay hands on him. Why? Because he spoke truth. But they feared the people. For they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they, notice how the dragons operate. So they watched him. And they sent spies who pretended to be righteous, deceitful, uh, that they might seize him on his own words. They want to trip him up on his own words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. 
And then notice how they operate. Then they asked him a question. Now, this is a loaded question. And I don't even know how many loaded questions I've fi- I have filled in in my lifetime as a pastor. A loaded question. It's the kind of question where the person doesn't want to discuss truth. They want to destroy you in truth. This is what they do with Jesus. A teacher, uh, we know that you say and teach rightly. And you do not show personal favoritism. They're buttering him up. But you teach the way of God in truth. They didn't believe any of that. It's a total lie. Uh, it's true from our perspective, but they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they, here comes the loaded question. Uh, we would just like to know from you, as the lawyers of our country, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a simple question. What were they trying to do? Well, get him to take sides so they could then destroy him. Uh, but he perceived their craftiness. And he said to them, this is most ominous. Why do you test me? Translated, are you kidding? You think I'm going to fall for that? I'm adding to the Bible. You think I'm going to, you think I'm going to fall for that? No, I'm not falling for that. That's exactly what you're trying to do. So what was Jesus' answer? His answer is profound. His answer, isn't it profound? They ask him a loaded political question. And what's Jesus say? Pay Caesar what's due Caesar and what's owed to God. You need to give that to him. Next, they didn't know what to do. See, Jesus pulled the curtain back on them and said, no, you're trying to test God with your devious teaching. See, David tells us that we should, first and foremost, pull the curtain back like Jesus did, like he did, to show people, let me show you Doeg. Let me show you Dave. Let me show you Donna the dragon and see what they are like. Hopefully, they will repent, and if they don't, you will know what you're up against. Second thing you should do uh, is remember that God will deal with the dragon. Uh, verse 5. He says in verse 5, God shall likewise destroy you, the dragon, forever. He shall take you away. He will pluck you out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. Uh, Selah. It's the, end of the, it's at the end of the discussion. See, the, you can't see it in English, but the very first word, the particle that opens this text is the word uh, gam. Uh, gam is like such or also. Uh, and and uh, it's out of w- w- normal word order in the Hebrew text. And so what that means is it's totally emphatic. So this is God looking down from heaven with a dragon and saying, here, let me grab you by the shoulders grammatically, change the word order so it's not in the normal word order so you will know exactly what I'm going to tell you. And he says, I, you need to really listen to me. You have forgotten, God says, that I eventually am going to destroy you. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to tear down your dwelling place. I'm going to bring in a wrecking ball and knock your house down, as it were. See, this is what our world tends to not talk about today, the holiness of God. Because if you challenge the holiness of God and you destroy God's people who are holy, God eventually says to that, my patience just reached how much I'll be patient. Now that's enough. He says, there comes the day that I will deal with you. Uh, It says in scripture, Psalm chapter five, uh, uh, verses four and five, similarly, he says, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity, and you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. I know it's not in the Bible, but it's, it's there in thematic content when we say what goes around. What's the rest of that? And it certainly comes around. You want to sow discord. You want to destroy people's lives. You want to lead a blasphemous life. You want to push evil, not godliness. Eventually, God says, there comes the day when I step in. And it's either in the here and now or it's, it's in the hereafter. But he says, there's going to be justice. I don't know about you. This is how I make it from day to day. To, that I know God who loves his people and loves justice will one day create righteousness and justice. There's another uh, proverb that's most interesting. Uh, chapter 24, verse 19. Uh, good counsel for us when you deal with people that try to destroy you. Don't fret because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of the wicked. Why? Uh, for there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. God says, you can see a wicked person right now flourishing and looking like they're getting away with anything and everything. But one day... They're going to be like a lamp in my presence. And I have one of these ancient lamps uh, from an archaeological site that I, that I got, that I purchased. And it's a little tiny clay lamp. It's just about this big, and it's small. They would fill it full of oil, and this, is, this would be the lamp you'd walk around the house with. He says, that's kind of like you as a wicked person. You, you think that you're just all that, but one day I'm going to take you as a little lamp, and I'm going to go, <laughs> done. <laughs> I mean, ominous, isn't it? But what does God really want? from the wicked. He wants them to repent. 
and turn to him. He wants to redeem them. He wants to cleanse them. He wants to save them. But if they will not do that, God says, one day I'll blow out your candle and deal with you. You know, I wouldn't want to go into a Christless eternity without, I mean, I want to go into eternity with Christ. But they're going to go into eternity without God going before them. Scary place. Stand with David when you're dealing with a person like this. Stand strong and true because uh, your job is to give them warning that there's a living God. Number two, and we close with this, verses six to nine. So uh, give them a word of warning, but also give yourself what I call are some words, some words of encouragement. So what does he say? It says, the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him saying, when I judge them, uh, here is the man who did not take God, uh, make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in all of his wickedness. What, what's he say? He says, what you should do after you warn them, if you live to see God judge a person who's wicked, if you live to see that happen, he says, you should see it and fear. I mean, because God is holy. And when he says, you shall laugh at the person who gets jobs, he's not saying, it's about time they got there. That's awesome. That's not what he's saying. He, he, this is like a, a laughter of righteous joy of thank you, God, for finally doing something. It refreshes my soul to see your hand move in a powerful way. He says, you should use that situation to train everybody in your life in the ways of God. Notice he says, you shall stop in fear uh, and then tell people around you, this is a person that sought themselves and not God. This is a person who relied on their riches and not God. This is a person who relied on their intellect, on their placement, their power, and all the wrong things and not God. And look at what happens when God deals with you. They're, they're left with nothing. So he said, make sure you instruct your people around you, children, uh, other Christians, other ladies, other men, other young men. Far better to, to fear God and walk before him and speak truth. He says in verse seven, here is a man that did not make God his strength. Are you going to teach those around you? Number two, he says, remember who you are. Because when you're dealing with a tr problematic person, you start forgetting like who you are and, and your calling. When I w dealt with people like that before, there came a point, I was near the Sierra Mountains uh, in, in great difficulty, just over, over every week, just hammering me. There, was, there were times I got in my car and I would eyeball the Sierras and I would think, I am just going to start driving and not come back. I had those thoughts. Um, and then I thought about my calling of God, that he called me to shepherd. And then I mean, it was always gonna be easy and I can't leave my post and I will not leave, leave my post. And, and so it's to stay. Because after a while you start forgetting who you are. Because the, the devil whispers in your ear, you're a loser, remember, you're not gonna make it. You know, you don't have blah, blah, blah. What does God say in verse eight? What does he tell you? What does he tell you about yourself? Verse eight, David says, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. Who, who are you really when the devil's telling you you're a, you're a dead tree, you're a worthless tree? What's Jesus tell you? Mm, no, in my temple, in my heavenly temple, it's like you're a beautiful, lush, fertile, fruitful olive tree planted there. Oh, I can see you. I see you, my eyes on you. I love the fact you're near me. See, you tend to forget God's eyes on you, as I said last week. Remember that who you are before God is, is that olive tree that produces for God. Uh, verse 9 says, your last bit of advice, the word to yourself is, I will praise your name forever. Why? Because you have done it. Done what? What this is, is David praising God before the fact for dealing with Doeg. This is him telling you, this guy is wrecking my life, destroying my life. I'm trying to live for you, but I'm going to pray and thank you as if it's already been dealt with, I'm gonna praise you before the fact. This is hard to do. You're praising God before the fact that he's going to deal with your situation to his glory and bring peace on your life. It's stepping forward to say, God, forgive me for complaining all the time. I'm gonna start praising you for the situation I'm in and may you get the glory. Will you give God the glory? Uh, sometime in your lifetime, you're gonna deal with uh, Dave or Donna or Doeg. Uh, may you stand strong and true. And may you not uh, waffle. Uh, and may you understand guys, God's eyes on you. May you give him praise as he works powerfully in your life. I've seen God move in miraculous ways, too private for me to share with you the things I've seen him do with these kinds of people. And every single time I've seen God do profound things, it is a humbling thing to watch because God's eye is on you. 
and he will protect you and he will guide you. And the same thing applies to um, the people that don't know God. He wants to redeem you and save you so he can use you. Let's pray. God, thank you. David is so practical. He is transparent. He's authentic. He shares his heart, his struggles. Uh, even though this was written thousands of years ago, it's still pertinent today uh, because the same old people are still walking the planet. Thank you for what he teaches us. Encourage anyone here today or online that is dealing with a difficult person and give them much wisdom on how to navigate with that person. And we pray for that person. Uh, you know who they are. We pray that you would convict them of their sinful ways, guide them to the cross of Christ, wherein they can be saved and find true life and peace. And again, we thank you for who you are and for how strongly you stand with us. May we not forget that as we head out this week in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.